Hello, I am Rachel Morgan, a sales trainer and coach that helps you convert your leads into paying clients while increasing the lifetime value of those clients through using client retention strategies. I am so excited because today I have Sasha Monique here with me, who is a brand strategist and designer with over 10 years working experience in her field. Her experience includes working for corporations and small businesses and within the retail industry. She eventually took that experience and created her own creative agency. And her favorite and most talented part is that she takes a brand's hidden gems and brings them to the forefront to increase their revenue, visibility, and scalability. So in today's conversation, we're going to cover how to really stand out in a saturated market and utilize the right sales strategies to help you excel. So this is a fun topic. My experience, of course, includes working in retail sales, and I can tell you that visual merchandising and branding are very important to the client experience and helping you stand out. So let's get her on here. Uh, Sasha, if you can request to join, I would so appreciate that. So everyone can learn from you and hopefully everyone can hear me and for everyone that is joining if you can go ahead tell us where you're from and if you have any questions at all too do let us know we'll make sure to answer them all right hello it works yes. hi <laughs> how are you i am so good can you hear me okay yes loud and Wonderful. clear hello hello well for everyone that is listening in where are you from Los Angeles, California, born and raised, which everyone's like, that's so right. Like, you don't find that out here anymore, I guess. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like, you never hear that people are actually like from LA and stay in LA. So yes, I am a native. <laughs> I love it. Well, hey, I'm from the Seattle area and I'm still here too. So yeah. I'm not alone. I'm in LA, <laughs> but West Coast, right? West yes, Coast. exactly. So I, ah, Denver, Colorado. I love Denver. That's a fun city. Colorado in general, though. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Have you been? Yeah. I haven't, but all my friends have, and I've seen pictures, and they're always like, it's beautiful here. I'm like, it's too yeah. cold for me. <laughs> it's kind of like Seattle, so yeah. in many ways. I mean, the elevation is different, but yes. um, but yeah, so I want to like get into branding and pick your brain, because I know that you have so much experience with branding that is kind of different, because you've actually been like responsible for creating branding for companies, yes. um, like in the visual displays, so um, yeah. How do you, let's just like dive right into it. Like, how do you recommend standing out? Like, give us all the good juicy <sighs> information. There's so many different ways. And I think with like every business and brand, there's a different avenue to go about doing it. Um, I will go through like my framework of how I do it. A lot yeah. of the time, I feel like people are so focused on trying to stand out in a way that's kind of like reinventing the wheel. But at this point in time, it's like, that's kind of impossible. It's not impossible, but it's just, it's really hard to have that innovation at the forefront with your brand. And so I feel like when people get burnt out in this concept of, you know, how do I reinvent the wheel in my industry? How do I do something that's so disruptive that it's going to shake everything up? They realize that they're not coming out with the right method that's in alignment with what they're trying to do. So they just fall back to what they've been seeing. They put their little personal edge to it visually and they call it a day. But the hard part with that is that like personal touches to what's already out there isn't necessarily going to help you grow. So for me, I go through a couple different strategies. Mm -hmm. One is heavily looking at the competition. And I always tell my clients, I'm like, I want you to spend a week just creeping on competition. They're like, this seems so like weird. I'm like, but you have to do it. Like you need to know what the offers are, what the pricing is, what their messaging is how they're getting in front of their consumer, but also on the back end of that, who's engaging, what posts are getting the most engagement. And this is social media based, you know, if we're going to talk digitally, right. you know, like what type of content is really driving the most action. That's the information that you need to know, because while we don't want to like replicate or copy, we need to figure out what's working for the people that you're ultimately going up against. On the flip side, I always tell my clients, right. We need to look at like what's coming up in your industry. So this would be trend forecasting. And a lot mm -hmm. of the time, there's small little trends. There's small little things that if you can leverage, it makes such a difference. I think, you know, there back when like Vine was first on the on the jump, you know, there was this really hello. <laughs> hello, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was letting you talk, yeah. <laughs> Um, but back when Vine was like coming to the forefront of social media, the people that jumped on video concept and video marketing then 
probably has seen the most beneficial success in their brands to date. Because while Instagram and TikTok are still like, Instagram reels are new and TikTok is still right. like kind of new. Vine set the precedence right. long time ago. So video marketing hasn't, it's not new, but the people that started to study that and be aware of it and be like, all right, this is big. It may have tanked, but there's going to be a resurgence. If we can capitalize on that trend, we're going to be able to really grow in a sense. So that was a very long winded response. But I think it's kind of having your eyeballs in multiple places while you're building up your brand. How can you speak to the right people in a way that's genuine, but also that's going to elicit some sort of response? Because while like for me and probably for you too, there's so mm -hmm. many brand strategists out here. We all look the same and we're all doing the same things. And there's only so many different ways that you can spin brand strategy. But how can I speak to my ideal client in a way that's going to make them feel so seen and so felt and like appreciated and loved and like I have their best interest at heart that maybe someone else isn't able to because of maybe relatability factors or because of different personalities. Right. So it's really just like looking at everything from like an aerial view standpoint and like, all right, there's a the competition, there's their messaging, there's trends. There's my offers and what I'm trying to do, but also where am I trying to go five years from now? And how do I go from A to Z, you know, multiple different areas. Yeah. Well, okay. So first of all, I feel like that was a lot. So just to kind of summarize what so I'm doing as well. No, but it was useful because, you know, I will tell you like one thing that I do in my strategy as well, especially lately is actually looking at what other people are doing. And like mm -hmm. you said, looking at their posts, what are they actually talking about over and over again? Right. And and then where do I stand out? Where does my knowledge change in that, right? right. And, um, you know, for me being a sales coach, obviously everyone wants to know how to close the sale and handle objections and sales calls and all that, but that's not my forte, but I know how to talk about it, right? Sure. My forte is client retention. So, right. um, but it's useful to see what they're talking about and who's responding mm -hmm. to it and what's getting, and I think we just get so afraid of like looking at other people, but right. I mean, we're in this together. We really exactly. are like, you know, and we each have our own unique thing we bring to it. So I think well, I love that you said that. And I think you made a, a really strong point there that like, you have your designated lane in which like you feel like, mm -hmm. yeah, I can do all these other things, but this is where I primarily exceed in. And I think especially for me, like, when you come from I come from a very creative background, very creative family, I also have ADHD. So my brain works in ways that like, I don't necessarily like it to, I can't ever zero in on one thing. And I think a lot of people that are in that same mentality have a really hard time with niching down and finding their, their mm -hmm. one lane that they're going to lock into. Even if you want to grow and expand in a couple years time to where you are offering all the different areas in which you can speak about the fact that you've been able to zero in and be able to say, okay, my like strategy is on client retention. You're speaking to people that don't have good client retention. So automatically they're going to be drawn to you. And that's a really smart strategy, especially in branding that you want to capitalize on, right. but not everyone can. So there, there's like some different finessing areas and ways to go about doing that. But I think that that's a really strong point. Right. Right. Well, your branding is like what people recognize you as. It's when you have mm -hmm. these brand ambassadors, it's what they, they lean into and, and see yeah. themselves in, right? Of course, obviously sales is very important to that and the relatability, like you said, but I mean, branding is what makes people feel connected. Yes. Absolutely. Like I think about my time in fine jewelry, right? Like there are logos and symbols or even just any big brand, right? Like people would wear the name of a company because they felt so connected to it, but mm -hmm. it's not just simply like wearing it. It's the feeling right. of that brand when you're a part of it. And that all comes back to commercials, marketing, visual appeal, you know, like you are ultimately being told every single day what your perception and what your opinion should be on said brand. So like when you see Nike commercials, you're being fed information. Yeah you're being told this is who we are you can't think of us any other way so when you do wear nike Ooh. you immediately embody what you're being told to embody so and that's where brand like branding is so much more than just visual dynamics which i know you know and a lot of people do know but most people don't know that branding so heavily is con like piggybacking on the messaging mm. you have to tell in such a like confident way what your brand is 
So people actually buy into that and then they feel some type of emotional response when they are a part of that brand. Yes. Oh, the emotional response. Absolutely. I mean, we see it with, um, yeah, Nike and new releases with shoes. Yeah. And I think of car commercials, right? Like where they put the Absolutely. car in the commercial, like it's eliciting like a response out of you. So I know yeah. I love it. So I think like one thing you said is like really, you know, stay in your own lane, focus on what you're good at. People don't know how to niche, to, niche. I can never say this word. <laughs> I should know this word. I know, <laughs> you know, we all know what it is. Um, but sometimes it's really hard to know what we actually do that's different and mm -hmm. what are edges. So what, how do you recommend people start with that? Look at your resume and look at your experience prior. Um, I that's think a good one. That, I'm sorry. That's a good one. Nobody does it. Like look at what led you to where you are now. Look at the jobs where you had the most like recommendations from, or you always had, mm -hmm. you know, like praise from figure out what you were, what you've always been complimented on and take that into whatever you're doing. For me, it was never that I can focus well. Like that was always like, people are like, <laughs> you need to like do one task at a time. And I'm like, but that's not where I thrive. I thrive on being multifaceted in a couple different areas. And ultimately I accomplished the thing at the exact same timeline anyways. So for me, right. it was that I think differently. And that's what I was always getting complimented on in like a backhanded sort of way in a sense. So I took that and ran with it and it worked out for me. But always look at your previous mm. experience. Also look at what you're passionate about because if you're not passionate about what you're doing, it's gonna ultimately show up. Maybe not the first month, maybe not the fifth month, but by month six on to 12, right. you're gonna see so much burnout. You're gonna lack creativity. It's just, it's not gonna paint out well for you. And why do something like yeah. that? I, oh, that was such an out of the box idea to look at your resume <laughs> and just to think about like, what do other people say about you? I mean, you can even ask people like, when you think exactly. of me, what comes to mind? I know I've done that exercise before and it's always really interesting to hear. Yes. Um, but I think that, you know, I mean, branding is such a big thing in general, right? But there's so many aspects to it. So really knowing like what you excel at within that is important. Um, and also so knowing what you don't okay. excel in. Yes. Yeah. Because then you can outsource that. <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. And I think we have to get comfortable with that too, because it's not yeah. always comfy to admit that. Yeah. And I think when it comes down to like, because that's coming from a personal standpoint, if you're having a personal brand, great. But if it comes to like, you're building out a business, like say a, a tech startup or something, and you're trying to find your edge, you need to look at, again, people in the industry, what has, what is their edge? You know, you can look there are case studies all over each brand online. If you're mm -hmm. wanting to go into luxury fashion or luxury retail or whatever, go look at case studies of Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Prada, all of these names and see A, their story on how they got to be, how they got to be because that's such a driver in who they are. But also you'll find out what their edge is. And then you're going to see that, all right, all these people have X, Y, Z as their edge. I need to make sure I'm a complete 180. And then you just have to brainstorm and figure out what feels most aligned. And it's not some easy answer to come across and it shouldn't no. be, it should be something that you really take the time to figure out. But at the end of the day, I think if you're offering a service, like majority of the, like our communities are, right. and you're kind of like the solepreneur, then you do want to look at what you're, what you're great at. And also what you can talk about endlessly nonstop without yes. having to like really prepare. Yes. Yes. So I think what you said was really good about researching other brands, maybe not mm -hmm. like your competitor, but other brands that have been successful, like Louis Vuitton, right? And I think that what you'll find, I know I have found, is that they never started where they're at now. They've evolved over the years. And that's almost Absolutely. humbling as a reminder that like what you're doing now will change. And it's a good thing and it's okay. It's only going to get better. Like, I, like Abercrombie, they were like a hunting store totally yeah. different right yeah. um and Louis Vuitton I think started as luggage I believe yeah yeah and now it's like known for purses right and so wow. well they still make luggage of course but um it's really interesting to see that and I what also came to mind when you were talking is I think it branding is what differentiates you from being like a side hustle and just mm -hmm. offering like a quick freelance service versus like mm -hmm. an actual brand that is long term that people yes. identify with that can recognize as soon as they see your colors and your fonts and what you're saying right absolutely yeah and i think that kind of goes back to those companies that started where they're not at now they niched into the lane that they could excel at immediately 
knowing that, all right, a couple years down the road, we're going to expand into these different avenues. And that might change the complete direction of our brand, but we've already established ourselves as an authority and built up a community and a fan base mm -hmm. that wherever we do pivot to, as long as they do it well, they're going to succeed. Right, right. Exactly. Yes. And I think just with time, you have to adapt anyways, too. I mean, Absolutely. like what's happened the last two, three years, right? Like a lot of people have had to change up what they're doing. Absolutely. Just being adaptable. Um, but I would love to hear your take because it's okay. So just to kind of take us to where we are now, you're like, okay, we need to see what other people are doing, right? Mm -hmm. Understand what is working for them through their content because we're assuming it's social, right? Mm -hmm. um, see what's working, what words, what topics, right? And then kind of identifying what makes us stand out, what we can talk about for hours on end, what other people think of us, have said about us, through our experience, all of that, right? But yeah. now that we have identified what our edge is, and we know what other people are doing, there's still gaps that obviously we can yeah. fill. So how, yeah. like, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Like, why is it important to then identify a gap? And how do we know what to fill effectively? Because even you said that too, with like um, Louis Vuitton, like they, they narrowed down, they got into what they're doing right now. They're excelling with it. So how do, how do we know? I don't know. That was a really wordy question, but I think I know. I know what you're saying. Though. <laughs> Essentially, how do you how do you fill a gap in your industry? Yeah. So filling a gap, and I think that's kind of like a ambiguous phrase, if you will. But filling a gap is basically right. just seeing what's missing in your industry and how you specifically can fill it, so you can profit off of it and exploit it, kind of in a way. And exploiting has a negative <laughs> a negative. It's a negative connotation, but it's not. <laughs> but well, how we look at it. Yeah. What? It's all how we look at it. Exactly. Um, a lot of like, I mean, we can use there's like a community fitness group in my area, specifically for moms where they can bring their strollers, and they can get a workout in interacting with their child. That brand filled a gap in the fitness industry in the community that all right, these moms cannot get a babysitter early in the morning, they still want to mm. get their workout in first thing. How do we fill that gap? They did it. So essentially, you're trying to find mm -hmm. something that even if people are already doing it, how can you do it better? And how can you do it in a way that's going to target a specific group that has a dire need for what you're filling and what you're offering? Um, and a lot of the time, it just comes to you naturally as you're doing research, as you're paying attention to what's currently being offered. It comes naturally. Um, I think Instagram's done a good job, maybe too good of a job with the changes happening literally every single week where they're finding gaps every day. Either, every day. <laughs> At this point, Adam, is, I feel like he's an extended cousin. Like, I feel like I know him. <laughs> but they're filling a gap so frequently. They're finding all the ways in which they're not profiting off of this app. Mm. And they're filling a gap to bring in more profit. That's really what it comes down to. How can you add more that's not currently there that people want? that then you can make money. And that's kind of like, unfortunately, that's what it comes down to, business is money. And I know a lot of people get turned mm -hmm. off by that topic, but it is what it is. Ultimately, you're trying to find multiple avenues in which you can either build, grow, elevate, or bring in more revenue. That's really what it comes down to. So to long story short, you research, mm -hmm. you see what's currently being offered, and you figure out if there is a market that is missing something that you know you can provide. Current brand currently providing well. I lost you for a second, but you're back. Okay. Um, but okay. I heard all that, so hopefully everyone else. Okay. Listening. Um, <laughs> I I love that, and I think that if you lean into what you're good at, right, and you really hone in on what your edges and it's something you can talk about forever, you're going to know immediately what's missing, you yeah. know? Like, I, I don't know about you, but <laughs> I can't ever go out in the world and, like, not pay attention to the teams and how people interact and the leadership and the way that they're right. talking to people. I notice it immediately. And I can tell you within five minutes what they can improve upon. And mm -hmm. I have a feeling you can do that with branding as well. You could look at a brand oh. and you know exactly, right? And so I yeah. think comes that down to have research like, a important. really good sense of business. Like if you can, and it, one of the pieces of the puzzle that I think is often missed is that people don't have a business plan. So when you don't have a business mm. plan, you have a really hard time at analyzing what you're doing mm -hmm. well, what the weaknesses are and where your growth opportunities are. And I think when you do have a business plan and you're also educating yourself 
in business practices alongside your own entity of you know what you do well then you have more opportunity to be able to find those pieces of the puzzle that are missing quicker right right well and it's good to have something to measure against too I yes that when you have a business plan you kind of know where you're headed you you can yeah it's you know, it, it's scary, it's confusing, numbers aren't fun, but they always no. tell you what you need to know. And it is important to do that for sure. Um, and I love that you brought Instagram into this because a lot of people, we don't, we get, we're like, oh my gosh, there's a new, a new feature to learn about. We get overwhelmed, but they're only, it's like Instagram would never do something that doesn't benefit you because it doesn't benefit them. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I mm -hmm. love that you said that they're literally just trying to fill a gap to make it better for you. And I think that's kind of like, we're all, well, at least I know I am, like my engagement has plummeted over the past couple months, as a lot of people have. And I think that's because they are filling gaps. More people are able to come in and participate in those gaps. So it's not mm. necessarily that maybe that algorithm is, is, you know, decrepit, but <laughs> there's just more active people on here right. because they finally have a place to be active. Ooh, that's a really good point. I like that. Oh my gosh, I'm like, so many like out of the box <laughs> ideas from you today. Like I need to see you more often here. Um, I do want to say one thing, though, just kind of like adding to everything that you've said and sales. And I think that, you know, branding is fabulous. Every company needs it. Obviously, it's something we identify with, we connect with. But you have to make sure that what your branding is, and at least my opinion, so I'd love to hear your mm -hmm. thoughts, it has to match the experience in store. So if you are or interacting with, I always say in store because that's my experience, but you know, yeah. even interacting with you, if I reach out to you, it should be the same feelings that I get through your branding, right? Absolutely. Because you are your branding. You like, you represent the company. Like how many times have we stopped shopping or buying from someone simply because the experience was bad? Right. Absolutely. And yeah. so you, you are your brand and people forget that, especially a team member, mm -hmm. right. That's maybe not in a leadership role. And so I guess hopefully I feel like my point is all over, but it's, you know, you have to make sure that your branding values are true to who you are and that you feel comfortable enough. And that is you too, in a way. So that way I mean, the experience is the same. You're creating an experience and that like, that goes from a bit, like when you think about all of your senses, like you have, the touch. So if you're in store mm -hmm. and you're touching a Louis Vuitton bag, you know that you're touching quality leather. You have the mm -hmm. smell of the leather or the smell of the mm -hmm. store. Maybe they have some like Abercrombie used to like infuse yes. the most toxic cologne ever. Yes. <laughs> and then you have the lighting, which creates a visual aspect. So you have mm -hmm. all these different sensory touch points that your brand should be touching on. And especially when you're operating digitally, it's hard to kind of touch on all of those, although it is possible, right. but that's mm -hmm. where messaging comes into play and also the brand experience. So when you go through the funnel of, you know, like you're talking through the DMS or you're binging all the content, when you finally get to talk to either a team member or the person, and then you go through the onboarding process or the sales process, that has to equate to what you're visually putting out there or what you're marketing. Because if it's not, then you're instantly going to lose someone. And then to go back to what your like mm -hmm. fine point is, is that you don't have client retention anymore. You have one bad experience. I'm not giving you thousands upon thousands of dollars to work with you anymore because it's just going to be shit. Right. Or buyer's remorse. They may ask for their <laughs> money back. Right. And we, I mean, all know that. Thing. we all know that one. We've all had those bad investments where you're just like, damn, I really spent that much money and this is what I got. Right, right. And so, I mean, it's all connected, right? Mm -hmm. That's like the beauty of this. And I think that's the good takeaway is that everything is connected, but it all has its own importance, right? Absolutely. And I'll say for myself, like my business has been 99.9% .9 referral based. So mm -hmm. I've never had to sell. So that's where I would come to you or someone like you to where it's like, all right, I'm at a point now where my business is growing in a way where I do need to bring in lead generation or whatever the case may be. But mm -hmm. selling is not my strong suit. I've never had to do it in the multiple years that I've done it. So now I need to offboard. And that's kind of what goes back to what we we're talking in the beginning where it's like, when you know what you're not good at, get someone to be good at it because it's a direct reflection of your brand and your business. Right. Right. Exactly. And um, how would we possibly know how to do everything? I don't know how to do branding. I've never been in branding. It's not my role. Right? I can't even do math. So, I mean, we're, it's not good. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I get it. You know, I, yeah. 
Um, well, one, I just want to kind of end on the spot and maybe there's something else you want to also speak to as well. So I want to give you that opportunity because I know um, our time is coming to an end. But, you know, I think we, we talked about finding your edge, learn about your competitors, learn about where those gaps are, see where you can fill up, but still also be competitive and understanding your messaging and your branding. And obviously we talked mm-hmm. about client experience and how important that is with your branding and making sure it's all aligned and um, especially with your team if you end up bringing a team on and you're scaling right that they understand it and they embody it um, which I always think of Abercrombie with that like just the image of their employees with their brand but they all look the same and they all smell yes. the same but so much <laughs> yes, it's, so overpowering. it's branding but um, we, we didn't forget it we did not forget it yes and um, so I would love to know, like, how then do we translate this into the online space, like our social media accounts? Like, how do we really, because yeah. you had also said to that, oh, lost my headphone. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you had also said that um, it's different online than it is in person, right? Because we don't have the, mm-hmm. all the sensories. Mm-hmm. So what is your take on that? I mean, at this point. I've had this conversation so much recently that it's no longer if you're good at what you do, it's if you can grab attention from people scrolling because nine times out of 10, whoever's scrolling on Instagram has already seen five people that do what you do. So they're going to be desensitized to your content anyways. So at this point, having, and I hate to use the word innovative because it puts so much pressure on it, but having marketing that is going to stop someone's attention is the key and that's unfortunately where like youtube got like all of their good and bad rep for clickbait but that's essentially what it's going to come down to i feel like at some point where a lot of content is going to go in that clickbait realm or at least the messaging and hooks of content will in a sense because it's no longer a matter of like look at me i'm good at this and i can help you it's look at me i got your attention how do i maintain your attention to where you keep coming back to looking at my content So content strategy is so huge. And I think as long as you know what your brand pillars are, content is pretty easy. But one thing that I'm working on with one of my clients is to maybe reprioritize investments. So instead of like prioritizing something that's a hefty price tag, whether it's coaching or a course or whatever, all those are important, but put the money into creating a copious amount of content for your Mm -hmm. brand so you're no longer using stock imagery because when i'm scrolling i'm like oh that's on unsplash oh that's on pexels like i know exactly where this where the content is coming from that i just i'm not interested because i've i've seen that piece of content or that image so many times that at that point i've already lost interest even if the content is like grade a full of high value I just mentally, I just, I keep scrolling. Like it doesn't capture me. So I think one of the main areas is really invest in not only a brand photo shoot, but going in and getting Mm. a serious amount of branded content, but specifically for social media. And that can be faceless, but at least it's telling the story of your brand in a way that people have yet to see. Right. I agree with you. I get really burned out to being on my feed because it feels mm-hmm. like the same thing over and over again and I get it and it's like I don't want that I need something that is different and that catches my attention right and I think that's a big opportunity for all of us when we are creating our content right going back to our competitive edge what makes us different and really leaning into it and I can guarantee if you feel that way because I know I have lately I've been so burnt out with this app like I'm just like it's, yeah. it's mind numbing. So if that's how you feel, then I can guarantee the person who's seen your content feels that way too. So get off Instagram and go to a different platform and try a different platform and reach a new audience. And then when you feel like you're getting burnt out on that one, come back to this one. Not don't throw this one out. Like keep your, keep your schedule posts, but don't be on here as much because I think we're all just at a point where it's like, there's so much being thrown at us daily and everyone is trying to grab our attention every second that we scroll. It's too right. much. It can be a lot. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and I do think Instagram is a powerful tool. So I would say everyone should be using it. Absolutely. But absolutely. it's okay to try out other things as well. Um, but I, I do want to read the. Oh, go ahead. Go. No, I was going to say, I'll leave it here. I think there's been such a huge surgence of people building communities off of social media like whether it's on their Kajabi or whatever, they're creating these membership platforms 
where they are taking people off of social media and really honing in on that nurturing and that relationship nurturing outside of here and building up a community. And that's essentially where, you know, client retention like stems from, but people are taking you off the app for a reason because they know that you're going to be hit with tons and tons of content that will either contradict what they say, have a different opinion, yeah. get into your head, start questioning, is this really the right place for me? Should I go to someone else? Um, so that's kind of like yeah. a little strategy that people are leaning into because they know the power of community right. building on social media. Yep. Everyone's always going to be telling you why their offer is the best and why it's different from someone else. And, you know, yeah, it does make you question it. And I think it causes a lot of imposter syndrome, but that's a different topic for sure. But so, whole yeah. <laughs> Um, I just want to read this comment really fast from Build a mm -hmm. Successful Business. They said, I wish more people knew and understood that they need to outsource what they are not good at and focus on their strong points. So they're just kind of commenting based on what you said as well. But, Absolutely. Um, yeah. But Sasha, how can people, obviously, if they need a strong brand, <laughs> they need someone to stand behind them to bring all their um, values together and everything and help them in their content. I'm guessing that you help with that. Like, how can they find you? Um, you can follow me, Sasha Monique Creates. So you can go to my website, sashamonique.com. Um, let's chat. Come on over. Um, I do, you know, free phone calls and consultations. So even if you just have some questions or whatever, then I'm more than happy to uh, shed some light and see if I can help out in any way, shape, or form. I love it. And, you know, I will say to uh, Sasha, you've always been so welcoming and warm and easy to chat Thanks. with over DM and you've never pressured or anything. And uh, you're a wonderful person to get to know. And Thank I know that your experience you. is so valid. And Thank I mean, just you. hearing what you've done for stores, big brands is so cool. And I think that's why we connected, right? Because of the retail experience that we both kind of yeah. share. I mean, a different type of retail, but um, so I definitely, you're a gem to know, and I definitely recommend everyone follow you and learn from you. And um, you definitely, you stand out in a really good way. So. Aww. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you do course, too. Oh, I'm so glad you. we connected. Yes. Well, thank you for your time today. And um, thank oh, you. I love it. Thank you so much. Okay. Build a successful business. You said, I just began following both of you. What you offer here is so valuable. So Aww. thank you. Love that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, everyone have a wonderful day. And if you have any questions at all, reach out to either of us. I know we're happy to answer them and uh, hopefully yeah. you learned a thing or two today. So. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. <laughs> Bye.